Amen. Good. Wow, there's so much going on around here. If we go over today, just blame everybody else, not me. It's not my fault. All right? Open your Bibles to Luke chapter 9. We, I know I say this a lot, but I'm, I'm telling you, this is the truth today. This is the truth. This is probably one of the greatest passages that we've seen in nine chapters. And I really don't believe that because it's all been great. But it is good. It's just a wonderful uh, passage, and I'm, it's a privilege to stand up here and to preach it to you. Uh, Luke chapter 9, starting in verse 28. Actually, we're going to start in verse 27, because that's kind of where we left off last week. Everybody have it? Okay. Luke says this, But I tell you, truly, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God. Now about eight uh, days after these saints, he took with him Peter, John, and James and went up on the mountain to pray. And as he was praying, the appearance of his face was altered and his clothing became dazzling white. And behold, two men were talking with him, Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory and spoke of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Now Peter and those who were with him were heavy with sleep, but when they became fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. And as the men were parting from him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good that we are here. Let us make three tents, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah, not knowing what he said. As he was saying these things, a cloud came and overshadowed them, and they were afraid as they entered the cloud. And a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my son, my chosen one. Listen to him. And when the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone. And they kept silent and told no one in those days anything of what they had seen. Father, speak to us now through your word. We pray in the king's name, in the name of Jesus. Amen. To experience the full impact of this uh, passage before us this morning, we really need to, you, you needed to be in church last week because last Sunday we looked at the requirements Jesus laid out for being one of his disciples. He said in verse 23 of chapter 9, he said, if anyone would come after me or if anyone wants to be a follower of mine, he must, and then Jesus listed the three requirements. The first one was, let him deny himself. Number two was, and take up his cross, and not only take up his cross, but take it up daily. And number three, he said, and follow me, follow me, live in obedience. And, and this was a, a hard message to hear. It was a hard message for them to hear. Certainly it was a hard message for us to hear last week. There is no easy believism in the gospel message. To follow Christ, one, one must deny themselves. It's no longer about me, but rather it's all about him, right? It's all about him. He becomes number one, his agenda, his purpose for me, his plan, his will for my life. It's all his. And I submit myself to him and I give up my rights. I deny myself. It's about you. Secondly, he said, taking up my cross, it would have been easy for a first century person to understand for they had seen the public spectacle of all the guilty people who were made to carry their, what I call their death cross. And they'd probably seen hundreds carry that cross to their final uh, place where they would be put on public display as they carried their cross for all to see and, and to the place that they would die. And, and, and along with that, no one survived a cross. It wasn't like... Um, you know, you took your cross and then you decided, okay, I'm going to change my ways and I'm not going to be a bad guy anymore and so I don't need this cross. No, if you were carrying that cross, you were going to die. That was it. And this was a perfect example of what it means to follow Christ. A death had to take place. The guilty had to die to himself in order to become alive to Christ. And that's the message of it. And Paul he described it this way. He said this, and I, I read this last week. And by the way, if you did miss last week, you can go online and listen to that message. But Paul described 
this kind of life like this. He said, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And Luke, he records for us that Jesus said that this death should take place in the Greek word, it, 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 it's katahemera, katahemera, and it means daily, daily. We got to get up and go, Lord, it's not me today. It's you. It's you. I got to die today. Literally, this word means it's the, the space of time between dawn and dark. Uh, when this word was used in the Greek mind, they would have understood it to mean or insinuated that it meant a 24-hour day. And so I, I need to pick up that cross and die to myself all day long, all day long, all day. And, and so as a follower of Christ, denying oneself meant dying all day long to self so that Christ could live in us and through us. And that certainly is a, a hard message, and it's sometimes we don't always do that, do we? And, the, and that's when grace comes in. But of course, the last requirement was Jesus said, follow me, follow me. You gotta follow me, continually follow me. It's a continual action. His plan, his will, his word, daily, transforming our minds, our lives, and so that Christ can accomplish his work in and through us. That's what it means. Now, that's, that's not an easy message to swallow, and I'm sure that the disciples as well as some of, some of you last week felt discouraged and I talked to somebody who said, hey, I, I'm just a little depressed. I'm a little discouraged because certainly as a believer uh, or as a follower of Christ, I don't always die to myself. I want to and I don't always deny myself and uh, I do want to please my master and I want him to live in and through me. That's, what, that's my desire is to die daily, but so often the struggle, uh, there's a struggle in my life for this type of life. And so I'm a little discouraged, and we talked about that. It's just too much. And in our, on our own, we certainly we fall short of the glory of God. And as I, as I read that, I said, well, you need to come back next Sunday because you're going to hear part B to the message. Jesus knew and understood this, and that's the reason, verse 28 says this. Now about eight days after these saints, he took Peter and John and James and went up on the mountain to pray. Jesus gave his disciples some time, one week, a space of one week, to think about what he had just told them. He didn't like bombard them the next day. He gave them a week. And he said, just think about it. Think about it. It's a hard message. Make sure you understand. Count the cost of what it means to follow me. And um, he said, hey, you gotta process this in your mind. It's a hard message of what's required to be a follower of mine. And um, you know, I, as I read this whole, I've been studying this, reading it over and over, I, I thought of these good news, bad news jokes. I don't know why I like those so much. And I just wanna share two of my, my favorite ones. An art gallery owner told his artist friend, hey, I have some good news and I have some bad news for you. The artist said, well, what's the good news? Well, the good news is that a man came in today asking if the price of your paintings would go up after you die. And when I told him they would, he bought every one of your paintings. And the artist said, well, that's great. Wow, that's wonderful. What's the bad news? Well, the bad news is, is that man was your doctor. So, <clears throat> and, and then, you know, Listen, just go, just go with it, all right? And, and then the, there was a lawyer who uh, told his client, I have some good news and bad news. And the client said, well, give me the bad news first. And, and the, well, the bad news is that the DNA tests showed that it was your blood. They found at the, crime, at the crime scene. And the man says, oh, no, I'm ruined, I'm ruined. Well, what's the good news? Well, the good news is your cholesterol's down to 130. So... <laughs> But you know, as I read verses 23 to 36, I kind of felt the same way. You know, bad news, 
good news. Or, or maybe it'd be better saying hard news, good news. Tough news, good news. Peter, James, and John, they certainly felt the weighty responsibility of being a follower of Jesus. They understood their humanity. And like us, after hearing Jesus' last message about denying themselves and, and, and dying to himself and continually following him, you know, they were no doubt confused, but even more, they were discouraged, as some of us were after reading that. And, you know, I can imagine these guys saying, oh, oh, you mean the kingdom of God is going to require that the Son of Man, you, Jesus, go to Jerusalem and suffer and be rejected and be killed? We thought you were going to rescue us by setting up your kingdom here and now. And not only are you going to die, but now you're telling us that if we're going to be one of your followers, that we too must take up our cross as well. And they certainly they understood what that meant because they had seen hundreds take up their cross and die. This was a hard message to hear, and I, I told you that last week. It was a hard message for us to hear as well. But then Jesus is going to give the good news that if these disciples would understand this good news of the kingdom, and then they could handle the hard message of following Jesus, of what it meant to follow him. Verse 28 tells us three things I want to mention briefly. It was a week later, time enough uh, for them to process and think through uh, the message that Jesus had just told them about what it meant to be a a disciple. I don't know about you, but in my life, sometimes I'll read, uh, I'll be reading the Bible, and, and, and sometimes I just read one verse, and I, I just stop. And sometimes I just close the, the book up, and I, and, and I just need time to think about it. I need time for the Spirit to just pound me with it, or to, I need time for that word to cut and just to, you know, do its job in my life. And so it was a week later. And, and while it's interesting to note that while Luke says it was about eight days later, um, it's not a contradiction because uh, Matthew and Mark said it was six days later. But obviously, uh, Luke just added the day Jesus made the statement and the actual day of the transfiguration, which added two days to Matthew and Mark, six days. Verse 28 also tells us that Peter, John, and James went with Jesus, uh, they were part of the inner circle, and I, there's a lot of reasons why those three, I don't, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but uh, they were in the inner circle of Jesus, they were the leaders who would have communicated to the others uh, what they saw at the appropriate time, which they did, and the third thing we see in this is the fact that they went up to a mountain. And already, uh, I was asked this week, what mountain was it? And I'm going, it doesn't matter what mountain it was. It doesn't say. And, um, you know, if, if Jesus and Luke didn't say, Matthew didn't say, Mark didn't say, if they didn't say, it's not important. We can guess, but I want to make a point here, okay? And this is, it's not so much about this mountain as it is just when we approach Scripture, um, don't add to scripture. If it doesn't say and it doesn't matter, if it doesn't matter, it's not the point of the passage, let it go. Leave it alone. In Genesis 22, let me show you the other side of the coin. We have time. In Genesis 22, you don't need to turn there, but we read that God told Abraham to take Isaac, remember, and go up to one of the mountains of which I will tell you Okay, and God makes a point to tell Abraham five times exactly where to go, what mountain. And, and it was in the land of Moriah, and of course, it was the future location of the temple where sacrifices would be made, and Abraham called the special location Jehovah Jireh, which means the Lord will provide. The location was important. And God made that point clear in the passage. It was a picture of a future event, how God would provide his lamb, Jesus Christ. However, in our text, 
all it really says is that um, eight days later, after these sayings, he took with him Peter, John, and James and went up to a mountain to pray. So we're going to leave it right there. Last week, I skipped over point four in my outline, which dealt with verse 27. Notice verse 27 with me. It says this, But I tell you, truly, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God. Point four was called the peak. The peak. Uh, Jesus was going to give them a peak into seeing the kingdom, okay, before they died. Not all of them, just some of them. And, uh, and uh, many are confused about what this actually means. And to me, it's just quite simple, really. Let's let Scripture speak for itself. One week later, Jesus takes some of his disciples up on the mountain to pray. Not all, right? Odd, not all. But he did say one week earlier that only some would see the kingdom of God, right? And so here we go. And so some, according to verse 28, is Peter, John, and James. It tells us who he took, the inner circle. And they were going to catch a glimpse of the kingdom. The, the kingdom of God was always at the heart of Jesus' teaching, and I could take 15, 20 minutes and just prove that point, but I think most of you realize that. This phrase, kingdom of God, uh, was used 61 separate times in the Gospels, 61 separate times, and 85 times overall where maybe uh, Matthew uh, quoted the same thing that Jesus said that Luke said, so that was 85 times, but 61 separate times uh, it was used, that phrase. The phrases kingdom of God and kingdom of heaven are synonymous. Uh, the gospel writers would use both phrases to describe what Jesus said. Matthew uses both phrases interchangeably in Matthew 19, 23 and 24. And, and the kingdom of God, if you had to just put it in a nutshell, it, the kingdom of God is understood as the reign of God. It's a place where God reigns. Uh, broadly speaking, it's, the, it's, it's as the psalmist said, uh, he said, psalmist said this, the Lord has established his throne in heaven and his kingdom rules over all, right? So God is God and God rules even though Satan is the prince of this darkness down here and uh, for the time being, God still rules. God still has his kingdom that he is uh, over, in a, in a, in a uh, narrower sense, the kingdom of God is his spiritual rule over the hearts and lives of those who have surrendered to him, and that would be us. But most people, when they hear that term, kingdom of God or kingdom of heaven, they associate the kingdom with heaven, as most of you probably would, which includes the millennial kingdom and the permanent heaven. As, as we look at our passage today, it's obvious that Peter, John, and James, uh, they just associated the kingdom as the place where Christ would rule. It was a glorious place, and it was future as well. Although in one aspect, Jesus was the fulfillment of all Old Testament prophecies and promises. A new covenant had been established, and so the good news of the kingdom of God really was already being ushered in at the time. And we understand that. But Jesus, after laying down the requirements for discipleship, now he's going to encourage his disciples by giving Peter, James, and John a glimpse of the future. And uh, for Christ and them, this was, this was just exciting. I, in your outline, notice in your bulletin there's an outline, and, and I, I titled this Kingdom Thinking 101. I just want you to see about the kingdom, what these three disciples would have experienced. Number one, a new body, a new body. Notice verse number 29. And as he was praying, the appearance of his face was altered and his clothing became dazzling white. The word altered uh, means to change. Matthew in his gospel uses the word 
transfigured, which really means metamorphu in the Greek, and we get the English word metamorphosis is going to take place, a change, his face changed, his clothes changed, his robe, which was obviously would have been dirty and stained from walking down the dirt roads uh, and sweating, and it, it became, uh, Scripture says, it became dazzling white, dazzling white. The word dazzling means that this, his, his white robe it emitted a, a brilliant flashing light, and, and this is so awesome. You know, the veil of Christ's humanity was pulled back so the disciples could see a brief glimpse of his glory. And uh, this, this is just gets exciting and more exciting as we go through this passage. Do you remember how John described uh, the glorified Jesus in Revelation 2? Let me just read this. It says this, And in the midst of the lampstands, one like the Son of Man. One, it, it looked like the Son of Man, looked like Jesus, but he was clothed with a, with a long robe and with a golden sash around his chest. The hairs of his head were white, like white snow, wool, like snow. Three different descriptions of his hair alone. And we're not going to take the time to tell you what each thing means because this is a study on Luke, not on Revelation. You'll have to come to the class when we resume it in uh, the fall. Uh, his eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze refined in a furnace. And his voice was like the roar of many waters. In his right hand he held seven stars. And from his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword. And his face was like the sun shining in full strength. And Luke writes that the appearance of his face was altered. It was altered. It was changed. Maybe, maybe, just maybe, it was changed like the sun shining in full strength that John would write later. We don't know. Notice verse 30b. It also says that Moses and Elijah, in 31, it says, who appeared in glory. The Greek reads, who having appeared in glory, they were glorified too. They had glorified bodies. Their bodies were changed, just like Jesus allowed his to be changed for the moment. I have some great news, some great news for you, Judy, some great news, Robert, for all of us, some good news. In heaven, the kingdom of heaven, we too will have a new glorified body. Amen? Amen? Now, you've got to show some life here today, all right? Or I'm going to go play golf, all right? Uh, we will have a new glorified body. Think about that. No more aches, no more pains. My back will be healthy, straight, and perfect. I will weigh 185 pounds instead of the 210 pounds I weigh. That was a joke, okay? <laughs> I wish I weighed 210 pounds. Give me a few months. A full head of hair, no limping, no headaches, no tumors, no cancer. I love 1 Corinthians 15, verses 50 through 57. You don't need to turn there. Just listen to this. It's about this mystery and the victory that's in Jesus Christ. Listen. He said this. I tell you this, brothers, flesh and blood cannot, in cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we shall be changed. He keeps saying it over and over again. We're going to get changed. We're going to be changed. You're not going to be the same. He goes on. For this perishable body must put on the imperishable, and this mortal must put on immortality. And when the perishable puts on the imperishable, the mortal puts on immortality. He just keeps repeating himself because it's like, wow, wow, wow. When the perishable puts on the imperishable, wow, the mortal's going to put it on, and it's going to be different. It's going to be changed. It's just like, He's caught up in this thought. And he goes on. He says, 
one more time, when the perishable puts on the imperishable and the mortal puts on the immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Can you imagine right about now how good I'm going to look in heaven? (laughs) Serious. This ain't the way it's always been, okay? How would I get a beautiful woman like that, you know? I was uh, 185 pounds, okay? Had some little bit of definition. It's gone. It's all down here hanging now. And, um, you know, I can imagine uh, Luke saying this. I'm going to look like Moses, Elijah. You know what? This was just pure encouragement for these disciples. This is pure encouragement for you and for me today. It is. It's not always going to be like this. We are going to be changed in an instant. As a pastor, I got to tell you, I get tired of standing over hospital beds. I, I, I do it, and I will do it, and I, I enjoy it, but I get tired of it. I get tired of performing funerals. It's not always going to be like this. 1 John chapter 3, verse 2. Listen to what John wrote. Beloved, we are God's children now. We belong to him. And what we will be has not yet appeared, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. Somebody just go ahead and say amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Come on. Hallelujah, preacher. That's good. Did you hear that? Are you serious? We know that when he appears, we shall be like him, glorified. It's going to be different. In the kingdom of heaven, We will have, number two, new friends, new friends. Notice verse 30 and 31. And behold, two men were talking with him, with Jesus, Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory and spoke of his departure or his exodus, which was about uh, to accomplish at Jerusalem. The the Greek uh, phraseology kind of says this, which he was about to fulfill in Jerusalem. The ESV is a little awkward there. Uh, th- and this is amazing. Think about what you're reading. Moses had been dead for 1,400 years. Elijah had been dead for 900 years, and yet, what is going on? Here they are, in glorified bodies, recognizable. They weren't some spirit. Woo! No, they were. They had bodily form. They knew who they were. They were recognizable. They weren't disembodied spirits. And they're talking with Jesus about his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. His departure in verse 31 means, really it just means his death, burial, and resurrection, how he was leaving, right? And and, uh, it's interesting, the Greek tense indicates that this was an extended conversation. So it wasn't about, oh, okay, you're going to die and... um, yeah, you're going to resurrect, and uh, okay, I'll see you later. They talked about it for some, some uh, extended amount of time. Moses, he'd been in heaven for 1,400 years. Elijah, for 900 years. And the redemption plan, which Jesus was about to fulfill, it must have been the talk of heaven, right? Amen. It had to have been. Everybody was awaiting this. And so what happens? Moses and Elijah goes down, and he's talking to Jesus about it. They want to hear about it. The fulfillment of the Old Testament. They want to hear about it. The Passover lamb. It's amazing. Amazing. But think about this. Kingdom living in the future is going to provide us with new friends, such as Moses and Elijah. You want to talk to Moses, Jim? 
course you do. Elijah, they'll all be there. David, Solomon, Isaac, Jacob, Jonah, Deborah, Rahab, Charles Spurgeon. Charles, talk to me. Charles Wesley, Fanny Crosby. I love that gal. She wrote some of the most awesome hymns in church history. She was blinded by a doctor. And she said, I will see him someday. I'll see him face to face. Wow. Martin Luther, John Calvin, mom, dad, old friends, new friends. They're all going to be there. And this was encouragement for the disciples. Listen, yes, you got to deny yourself. You got to pick up your cross daily. Yes, you got to follow me if you want to be a follower of mine. But it's going to be worth it. It's going to be worth it. This is for a short time. And you're going to live eternal, in eternity with me, with Moses and, I, and Elijah and everybody else. It's amazing. Can you imagine for all of eternity being able to talk to and to worship the Lord together with, some, with Moses standing next to you? It's just... Moses isn't going to be the prize in heaven. I can tell you that. It's not Moses. It's the Lamb. It's the Savior. He is the one who's going to be worshipped. But just thinking about this, it's just, it's so encouraging. It is. Number three, a new perspective. Verse 32. Now Peter and those who were with him were heavy with sleep, they were, or they were weighed down with sleep. Their eyelids were heavy. You've been there. You can't open them up. They were heavy. They were exhausted. They were tired. And it says this, but when they became fully awake, they saw his glory, and the two men stood with him. Do you realize someday we're going to be fully awake? Fully awake. We're going to know what's going on. I love it. I love it. Did you notice they saw his glory? 1 Corinthians 13, 12. Write that down, and you study it later this week. It says this, so. For now, today, for now, we see through a mirror or a glass dimly. It's all, it's, it's dim. It's kind of obstructed. But then, face to face. Now I know in part. Then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. When we get there, face to face, we shall know fully. No more dim glass. Today we have mirrors. And really, he's talking about a mirror there, okay? And today, mirror, the reflection is almost perfect. It's 99.9% perfect. We see more than we really want to see sometimes, right? But in the first century, a few thousand years ago, the mirrors looked kind of like uh, looking in the water, seeing a reflection. It was, it was polished brass or something, and it wasn't that good. But then there's going to be no more dim glass, no more obscurity. We shall see, let this soak in, we shall see the king of kings face to face face to face, and we too shall see his glory. In 1898, Carrie Breck, she wrote this song, and I, I'm just going to read you two stanzas. I'm not even going to read you the chorus. It says this. She captured this. Face to face with Christ my Savior, face to face, what will it be? When with rapture I behold him, Jesus Christ who died for me. Verse 2, only faintly, only faintly now I see him with the dark lean veil between. But what a blessed day is coming when his glory shall be seen. That day is coming. It's coming. Today, Christ church needs to see the glory of the risen king. We need to see it. It'll motivate us. It'll change our lives. We It'll determine who it is whom we serve. We are ambassadors for the king of glory, not just a good religious man, the king of glory. That's who we represent. 
Billy, that's who you're going to represent for the next two weeks. Don't forget it. The king of glory. It's him. You are his representative. Speak truth boldly. But in the kingdom of heaven, we will have a new perspective. But we're also going to have, number four, a new, new encouragement. Verse 33, notice it. As the men were parting from him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good that we are here. Let us make three tents, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. Um, not knowing what he said, Luke added, okay, there's a lot going on in this verse, and I just can't, I'm, I'm not going to spend the time. Some of you would be bored to tears. Maybe me, I would be bored to tears. What's that? Well, that's, we're going to talk about that. You let me, you, you let me preach. You listen. All right? All right. First of all, if there was ever a time to be quiet, this was the time. This was a holy moment. Jesus, Moja, Moses, and Elijah revealed in their glorified bodies were discussing the cross being a fulfillment of God's redemptive plan. If you were there or I were there, hopefully we would just zip it and listen and watch. What an amazing, amazing scene. Peter, just be quiet. Know when to keep it closed. Listen and observe. Sometimes, more than not, we just need to sit at the feet of Jesus and listen. Not whine, not complain, not give our opinion. Just in silence, say, Master, speak to me. I'm, I want to listen. But Peter, he wanted to construct three tabernacles. And you notice, we're going to do one for uh, you, Jesus, one for Moses, one for Elijah. He put them all three on the same level, which was, you know, and Luke adds in here, he didn't know what he was saying. Like, what are you saying? Bizarro, really, is what it was because he thought, Peter thought, that he was witnessing the inauguration of the kingdom. This is it. Jesus, Moses, and Elijah. It doesn't get better than this. Kingdom, here we come. Let's go. Get it going right now. And since the Feast of the Tabernacles was being celebrated at that exact time, which celebrated Israel's exodus from Egypt, what a perfect time to celebrate Jesus leaving the earth. But by doing that, Jesus would have to bypass the cross. And that's what Peter didn't understand. Maybe he did. He just wanted Jesus to bypass the cross. As, as was often the situation, he put his foot in his mouth. And Luke records for us, again, notice 33C, that Peter, not knowing what he said... This was not the beginning of the kingdom. This was not the beginning. Jesus had to fulfill his mission. Calvary's cross could not be bypassed. This was the plan of the Father. But Peter, he was so excited and so encouraged by what he had seen, and, and that's exactly what a focus on the future kingdom will do for us. It will. I can, I can serve Jesus. I can read my Bible and pray. I can go to a midweek Bible study. I can deny myself. I can die daily. I can follow Jesus. Why can I do that? How come? Why? Because I am going to the kingdom. Hallelujah. I'm going. I can do it. I'll discipline myself. Number five, there's a new dimension. Verse 34, as he was saying these things, a cloud came and overshadowed them, and they were afraid as they entered the cloud. Peter, James, and John, they were afraid. Moses, and Elijah, and Jesus weren't afraid, okay? It was the three disciples. The cloud, or this cloud, it was the visible presence of God and his Shekinah glory. That's what it was. And it was the same Shekinah glory that passed by Moses as God covered him in the cleft of the rock. Same glory. It was the same Shekinah glory that led Israel from Egypt. Same glory. 
It was the same uh, Shekinah glory that filled Solomon's temple when it was dedicated. Remember, the priest couldn't even go in. The same glory that Ezekiel saw depart out of the temple because of Israel's apostasy. It was the same glory that filled heaven's throne room for uh, Isaiah's vision that he had. And it's the same glory that we will encounter when we step into eternity. Amen? Amen. Amen. It's a new, awesome dimension that we're going to step into eternity. It's not the way it's going to be like it is right now. Number six, a new reality. I'm getting there. Verse 35, and a voice came out of the cloud saying, this is my son, my chosen one. Listen to him. Luke, he he had been making this point for the last nine chapters, and that is that Jesus was the son of God. He's the son of the Most High, the chosen Messiah. And verse 36 is interesting uh, because it says this, and when the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone. Moses and Elijah, they're gone. And it says, and they, Peter, James, and John, what did they do? It says they kept silent and told no one in those days anything of what they had seen. They kept silent. There were a lot of reasons they kept silent. I just wrote down three. Number one, it probably sounded crazy. Are you kidding me? Oh, so you're telling me Moses and Elijah were there? You mean Moses uh, 1,400 years ago and Elijah 900 years ago? And they were there and you saw Jesus. His humanity was pulled back. You saw, okay, good. Um, you know, they, they sometimes, listen, we experience that today. Some, sometimes people think we're crazy when we're telling them about what God's had done in our lives, right? It's true. And the second thing is, this was a holy moment for these three disciples. It was intense. And Peter, after the resurrection, 35 years later, Peter is going to comment about this. Let me read you what he said in 2 Peter 1, verse 16 through uh, 19. He says this, For we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For when he received Honor and glory from God the Father, and the voice was born to him by the, by the majestic glory. That's how John saw this. It was majestic glory. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. He goes on, he says, We, he, we ourselves heard this very voice born from heaven, for we were with him on the holy mountain. We were there, and we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed to which you will do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. That is, a, I know I just read it. We, I should, we, should, we need to deal with that at some, some point. But you know what he's saying? He's saying this. It's coming. It's coming. Don't fall asleep. He says, we saw it. We saw it. That is coming. His majestic glory, his glory, that day is going to dawn and the morning star is going to rise up in your hearts. It's going to motivate you. It's going to move you. A new reality is going to take place and it will motivate us to live for the Lord today. Number three, and the third thing is, the reason they kept silent, because it would have caused chaos, right? If they would have, you know, the, the Romans were already worried about a, uh, you know, insurrection amongst the believers because the king was here, they heard. And so they were worried about that. And also, the Jews, um, they would have tried to take Jesus by force like they did before and tried to make him a king Before his time, they didn't understand. They wanted that political king. And so it was better that they said nothing. Let me give you three brief applications. Number one, 
I want to encourage you. The fight will end. It's going to end, folks. Um, It's not going to be like this forever. Paul said this, I have fought the good fight. Yes, it was a fight. It was a battle. But it was a good fight. And he goes on and says, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. I'm here to tell you today that the fight will end someday. It's going to end. Number two, the struggle will be worth it. It's going to be worth it. Paul finishes the verse I just read by saying this, Henceforth there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not to me only, but also to all who love his appearing. That's you and me. It'll be worth it, folks. All the work of building a church, worth it. Say worth it. Worth it. All the work, the labor of the battle, worth it. Working with kids, high schoolers, teaching home Bible studies, leading the women's ministry, Awana, the nursery, worth it. It's worth it. And number three, the kingdom will be awesome. It's going to be awesome. It's just amazing seeing our Savior, Redeemer, King face to face, face to face. Can you imagine and saying to him, if we can speak at all, I don't know, but maybe, maybe we could get out. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for the mercy, the grace, the compassion when I didn't deserve it and I was ready to quit and I felt like a loser. You forgave me. Your grace was sufficient. Glorified bodies, a new heaven, a new earth, a time with new friends, a new perspective, new encouragement, a new dimension, a new reality, a time of reunion with family and friends, a wedding banquet. You know what I'm talking about. Read Revelation. Singing and worshiping our King. No more death, no more sorrow, mourning, crying, pain. Why? Because the former things have passed away, all gone. And so what's the conclusion? I believe the, this passage intent was to encourage Peter, James, and John, and us 2,000 years later, so that we would say, the future is so awesome, I will deny myself. I will take up my cross daily. I can do it. I can follow Jesus. I can do it because it's all worth it. Father, I thank you for this passage of Scripture, and I, I'm sure I butchered it. I couldn't have done it justice because there's just so much meat in it. But, Father, I, I, I believe your saints, your people understood. They read it, and the Spirit spoke to them. So, Father, I just pray that we would be kingdom-minded as we go through this work and as earth and as we finish our task at hand. And while we still have breath and we still have a pulse, I just pray that we would just serve you and we would work for the kingdom and tell people about you, about the good news of the kingdom that's coming and how they can be a part of it. Oh, Lord, that's the message today, and we thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen.